Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another reading of, from the Bald Explorer. Uh, to get us through the lockdown, I'm continuing with my reading of J.B. Priestley's English Journey, which at the beginning of it says, English Journey being a rambling but truthful account of what one man saw and heard and felt throughout during a journey through England during the autumn of the year 1933. 1933. That's the thing to just bear in mind as I read the book. To thank you very much for joining me. <clears throat> I've got a slight frog in my throat, as they say. Uh, good morning to Ed Loud and to Philip Hammond and, Mer and Mary um, and to Lisa Ramibu, uh, to Audrey. Good morning, all. Hope you're all well. Another sunny day here in Sussex, uh, down here in Worthing anyway. I I'm, I'm hope it's nice and sunny. A little bit of a cool breeze. I went out first thing to record uh, another walk, which will go out this afternoon, uh, yet to be edited. Um, one thing I'm going to aim to do today is to drag out from the back of the shed my bicycle and try and see if it's in any fit state to ride so that I can actually go further afield and either do some videos from the bicycle or cycle somewhere and then do a, a short little walk and get back on the bike. I hope um, that won't be frowned on. I'm sure it will be frowned on by people because you can't, you cannot <coughs> please all the people all of the time, it seems. You can only please some of the people some of the time. And if I please any of the people any of the time, then I'm a better man than you are, Gunga Din. Uh, and so, yeah, so... I know people say, oh, you've got to do one form of exercise, either cycle or walk or run or whatever it may be. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of other bits of exercises that people are doing, like uh, perhaps people, when I lived in Shrewsbury, people would, cycle, uh, would go on the river doing rowing, you know, the long format like the, <coughs> the Oxford and Cambridge rowers, that sort of thing. Well, some people would have to walk to the uh, boathouse and so presumably you know that's walking that's an exercise isn't it and then they're going to go rowing so you can't uh, or they might cycle to the boathouse and then do the rowing which is their main thing the other thing was just a conveyance so that's the way I'm looking at it is the cycling may be the exercise itself but on other occasions it may be the conveyance to use the beautiful terms in this old book and yes I may perambulate to the boathouse uh, and uh, and then go in the, they may see, see the boat you know you may if you lived by a river you may get onto a rowing boat and use the rowing as a conveyance to then take you to the place that you're actually going to do the walk uh, it, it is all a load of old nonsense this whole thing and provided people keep themselves at a safe distance from each other they don't go to crowded places and they're not uh, infecting anybody or touching everything in their path really and truly you know what difference does it make we don't want to live in a police state we just want to get through it and go back to normal and I think that's the case for everybody we just want to get through it uh, Andy Stacey, good morning to you. Laura Riddle, good morning. Uh, Rami Boo, well, that would be good as long as it's safe for you. Don't crash or something. Let's try and stay positive, Lisa. Try and stay positive. Uh, I have a bicycle. I have ridden bicycles for years. I don't intend to crash, but my goodness, we can't rule out... We can't rule out accidents and things an aeroplane might land on my head you know if I just poke my head out the window or a bird might fly into my eye and peck out my eye we, we you know let's just try and stay positive for goodness sake otherwise none of us will just get out we may as well just sit in the airing cupboard and and put the heating right on and and just die in a horrible and agonizing dried out crispy way let's 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 just stay positive for goodness sake the morning here has only just started, so um, we've got to get through this and let's just have an open minds, shall we? Uh, <clears throat> as I say, you can't please all the people all of the time. And that is ever becoming more truer by the minute, it seems. Anyway, morning to you, Leslie. Lovely to see you. I'm going to start reading now J.B. Priestley's English Journey. 
I hope you enjoy it. Um, the more one gets into the book, I think the more you get into the style of the, the writing um, and the observations. Bear in mind, this is 90 years ago, just pre to the Second World War in 1933. Um, and it's a fast for me, it's a fascinating look at what British life was like after the First World War and the Great Depression and uh, the lack of work and the state that people were living in. And um, not that we live in anything like that, but uh, we're all living in a slightly, in a, in, a, in a somewhat restricted world at the moment. And in a way, this is very much what uh, seems to be going on there. No, no, says Raymond, I meant trying to ride and hold the camera. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yes, I, I've actually, I did do a video where I was on a, um, must have been last year now, last summer, um, I think, or autumn. And I, I, yes, and also you can bolt the camera to the bicycle. So it should be fine, should be fine. Sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't mean to have a go at you. <laughs> I'm just slightly, uh, uh, I'm not really on edge, but, um, you know, I think people are frustrated and people are uh, wanting to, to, vent their frustration and and people like me who put their head over the parapet are easy targets for people uh, and I'm not suggesting for a moment Lisa that that's what you're doing but I just think people are you know that, that they're frustrated the situation isn't great life is hard for people and they you know it's 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 people like me who are supposed to be thick-skinned um, who pop up on their screen and they think oh Richard, you're bloody annoying me. And and I probably am. That, I mean, you know, that's the difference. I probably am annoying people. But it isn't intended. Right, here we go. <clears throat> I'm annoying you now because I haven't got going on this. And if you're watching the rerun, by the way, you can just skip out this early preamble. If you're watching live, I'm afraid you, you can't. That is the nature of it. Right, so this is, uh, he's on his way. He was in Coventry. And I think he's going to be going to Birmingham. J.B. Priestley. When I awoke the next morning, I felt a tiny but distinct thrill of pleasurable anticipation. The routine of getting myself ready to face the world was, I knew, to be broken this morning. Then I remembered that having left my razor behind somewhere the day before, I had bought a new an original safety razor and had been given with it a tube of new and entirely original shaving cream. Luxuriously, I rose to play with these toys, but before using them, I carefully read the maker's accounts of them on the outer wrappings. The razor, I learned, was designed to revolutionise the practice of shaving. It was designed on a new principle, and having, giving it, and having giving it the most superficial trial, I would never want to use any other. The shaving cream was also on a new principle. It made shaving a pleasure. Its lather was so quick, so foaming and creamy, so smooth that you were in danger of using this cream without the excuse of a shave. Inspired by these rhapsodies, I began shaving at the earliest possible moment. The cream was wretched stuff. The lather it made was no better than that from ordinary soap. There was no sound reason for its existence. The razor didn't give me a proper shave at all. It was not what I... It was not that... It was not... <clears throat> it was not that I could not handle it well, but simply that it would not cut hair... I spent a good ten minutes scraping away with it, and even then I was only half shaved. I am still wondering what the lying manufacturers of these articles had in their minds when they made them. Are they merely depending on the number of people, like me, allowing themselves to be caught once? Or do they honestly believe that they've turned out a good shaving cream and a good razor? And if so, why? They've had plenty of opportunities to test the articles for themselves. On the other hand, surely it's hardly worth <coughs> surely it's hardly worth going to the trouble and expense of manufacturing, advertising and marketing things they do not believe in themselves. What is the history of this bad shaving cream and useless razor? 
Having shaved, disillusioned once more, I caught the bus that runs between Coventry and Birmingham. It was very full and so very uncomfortable. The weather was still fine but colder than it had been with a sharp nip in the wind. We trundled along at no great pace down pleasant roads, decorated here and there by the presence of huge gaudy pubs. These pubs are a remarked feature in the Midlands landscape. Some of them are admirably designed and built. Others have been inspired by the idea of Merry England, popular in the neighbourhood of Los Angeles. But whether comely or hideous, they must all have come at, they must all have cost a pot of money, proving that the brewers, and they seem to be all owned by brewers, still have confidence in their products. At every place, however, I noticed that some attempt had been made to enlarge the usual attractions of the beer house. Some had bowling greens, some advertised their food, others their music. No doubt even more ambitious plans for amusement would have been put into force if there had been no opposition from the teetotalers, those people who say that those people who say they object to public houses because you can do nothing in them but drink, but at the same time strenuously oppose the publicans who offer to give their customers anything but drink. The trick is, and it has long been, to make or keep the beer house dull or disreputable and then point out just how dull and disreputable it is. It's rather... <clears throat> as if the rest of us should compel teetotalers to wear their long hair and to wear their hair long and unwashed and then should write pamphlets complaining of their dirty habits look at their hair we should say in the midst of a russet solitude we came up upon a notice board saying this is the city of birmingham there was nothing in sight but hedgerows glittering fields and the mist of the autumn morning. For a moment I entertained the wild hope that this really was the city of Birmingham, that the town had been pulled down and carted away. Not that Birmingham had, Birmingham had ever done anything to me. I'd never been there. This was my first visit. I knew very little about it. The little I did know, however, was not in its favour. I'd always thought of the place vaguely as perhaps the most typical product of civic, civic life of 19th century industrialism, as a city of big profits and narrow views which sent mission, missionaries out of one gate and brass idols and machine guns out of another. It made a great many, <clears throat> it made a great many articles, chiefly in metal, but so far in my life not one of these articles had gained any hold over my affections. I'd never said, good, good old Birmingham, to myself. I'd never heard anyone else say it. In my limited experience, made in Birmingham had been a dubious hallmark. And the Chamberlain family supplied, the Chamberlain family had supplied no heroes of mine. Then there were the jokes about the foolish wash, watch committee on the other hand, any guidebook could offer a great many facts on the credit side. In the 18th century, Birmingham had a lunar society that met every month and among its members were James Watt, Matthew Bolton, Joseph Priestley, Josiah Wedgwood, Erasmus Darwin, Sir William Herschel and Samuel Parr, all good round team of talents. The number of important inventions, from the steam engine to gas lighting and electroplating, that either first saw its light or was first brought to perfection in this city, is very impressive. Its commercial success has not, mean, not been merely a matter of geography and geology, the fact that it has been the centre of the district in the coal, iron, wood and sand. History comes into play here. Not being a place of any importance in the Middle Ages, Birmingham was not controlled by the guilds and did not suffer from the various restrictions imposed upon them than the larger towns. It was not a chartered borough and therefore non-conformists were free to settle and work here 
and, as the Industrial Revolution was largely non-conformist, Birmingham was able to take full advantage of it. Thus, when you hear bad jokes, well, sorry, when you hear jokes about Birmingham Watch Committee and Chorus Girls stockings, you are really at the end of a very long chain of historical cause and effect. Having allied itself to the black slavery of industry, the city managed to strike one or two stout blows for liberty in other directions, for which it must be given credit. And now it is the second city in England. By the time I had considered these matters, the grass had gone and we were passing houses and shops and factories. Did all this look like the entrance into the second city of England? It did. It looked a very dirty muddle. Where the bus finally stopped, a Birmingham citizen asked me if he could carry my two bags to the hotel. He was a young man, this Birmingham citizen. He was dressed in a ragged brown coat and a pair of patched and torn flannel trousers and a wreck of a pair of boots. His face was swollen and it was so long since he had shaved that he was well on his way to becoming he was well on his way towards wearing a matted tow coloured beard on our way to the hotel i asked him a good many questions but many of his replies i cannot give you here because he spoke so badly that i couldn't catch them but he was 22 and he'd been out of work since he was 16 was not receiving the dole had a father but no mother and his father was also out of work it was a fair step to the hotel and one of my bags I knew was heavy so I told him to put it down and rest a moment when he was tired but there must have been a good blood and bone somewhere in that ruin of a young fellow for he never stopped or even slowed up but moved on at a good pace until he came within a yard or two of the hotel porter who looked at him and spoke to him in a fashion that most of us would hesitate in to hesitate to adopt in talking to a mongrel that was snapping at our heels. However, I gave him a florin, which was what he usually made, with luck, in a whole day, and he went off delighted. There was a sudden access of civic dignity in the place. Here in Colmore Row, you could imagine yourself in the second city of England. There is a, a really fine view at the end, where the huge council house turns into Victoria Square. You see Hill Street mistily falling away beneath the bridge that the post office has thrown high across the road. If there is a better view in Birmingham than this, I never saw it. For a moment, as you stand there, you believe at last that you have found an English provincial, prov provincial city that has the air and dignity that a city should have, that at last you have escaped from the sad, dingy muddle of factories and dormitories that have been allowed to pass for cities in this land, that at last a few citizens who have eyes to see and minds to plan have set to work to bring comeliness into the stone hotchpotch that Birmingham has had the sense to design itself with, as well as as well as the screws, steam cocks and pressure gauges. This is an illusion, and the only way to keep it would be to hurry away from that corner of a closed... Vi hur this is an illusion, and the only way to keep it would be to hurry away from that corner in a closed vehicle and see no more of Birmingham. I could not do that, but I could do the next best thing. I entered the Corporation Art Gallery and museum, of which I had heard a good deal. The director of the gallery assured me that Birmingham always had its craftsmen too, and proved it by showing me case after case of local silverware, some of it tasteless design, but all of it admirably executed. He also showed me some drawings done by young students. One of them was only a boy of 15 at a local school of art, and these were surprisingly good. He assured me too that Birmingham could be very generous towards its gallery and museum. There were two cases of exquisite Chinese porcelain, and he told me that the necessary 
sum, I think it was between two and three thousand pounds, to buy these objects of art, which are quite useless and will never declare a dividend, had been raised in a few days. Oddly enough, two other cases of Chinese porcelain, equally exquisite, had been lent to the museum by a famous comedian whose jests about Birmingham's prudery I still remember. The picture gallery is famous for its wealth of examples from two English schools, the old watercolourists and the pre-Raphaelites. I did not spend much time with the pre-Raphaelite collection, which is particularly rich in drawing, because I get very little pleasure these days from the work of Burne Jones and friends. I was fascinated, as I always am, by Ford Mattox Brown, who was not really a pre-Raphaelite, and those and whose best work always seemed to have an odd magical quality of its own. Perhaps the secret lies in the queer mix of realism and the fantastic. You stare at the immigrants and workmen until it all grows eerily, and you begin to feel that somebody, probably Ford Maddox Brown himself, is looking at you through the canvas. Actually, if he were... He would be better off than you in this, in this gallery, which is spaciously contrived and well-built but badly lit, with more honest daylight filling the floor than ever reaching the walls. It's probably good and proper that Birmingham should accumulate pre works of art, which are so entirely different fr from itself that their very presence together is sufficient to prove the rich breadth of this world, but for my part, I like life and art to neither, to be neither Birmingham or Bernie Jones, but to travel on the honest roads that march between the deacons in counting houses on the one side and the drooping maidens in hot houses on the other. In fact, I like life and art to have a much more. I like like I like life and art to have much more in common with that other school of painting so, we so well represented here, that the good old English watercolourists, who, whatever their private lives may have been, always impress me as being about the happiest sort of men who ever lived this country. They wandered about while the countryside was still unspoilt. They saw everything worth seeing, and what they saw they turned into enchanting bits of drawing and watercolour painting. They are a they are, equivalent, they are equivalent in visual art to our lyric poets. God created them while there was yet time to catch the lovely old England in line and wash, to open some little window onto it forever. Their very names, Turner, Gert, Gertin, Co Cotman, Cox, Varley, Bonington, and like the name, are like the names of villages and apples. They have more of Cox watercolours here in Birmingham than you could find anywhere else. They're not all good, for nearly all of these industrious fellows were very unequal, but the best of them would make a man shout for pleasure if he were not in a picture gallery, which I take to be a place where we never raise our voices. It's the, it's the weakness of visual art that it must be largely sought in these inhuman institutions, where you cannot lounge and smoke and argue, and where you unconsciously begin to tiptoe until you're very, soon your very feet and legs ache. I had the luck, however, to get into part of the gallery temporarily closed to the general public, and there is a friendly curator who fished out some lovely specimens of Gertin and Cotman and DeWint. They have their a little harvest scene by De Wint, a tiny wagon or two, then a glorious melting distance of rolling country and sky that I should dearly like somebody to steal for me. It lit up my morning. All the years between Peter De Wint and myself were annihilate <coughs> all the years between Peter De Wint and myself were annihilated in a flash. He pointed and I saw, he spoke and I heard, and his mood felt on the autumn day long ago was mine. Not sure that, what that meant. Whatever cloud of gloom covers Birmingham in my memory, I only have to recollect, I only have to recollect, recollect that corner of its gallery to recall that stipple and wash of paint on a bit of board 
and my memory is touched with colour, warmth, vivid life. How many people have already felt that about one little picture there, and how many people still have to experience? And how many pounds were paid for that watercolour? There is a nice little sum waiting to be worked out by some ingenious person. The result, I think, would prove that Birmingham, or any other city with a decent art gallery, can disperse enchantment in less than a penny a head. At the entrance to this art gallery and museum, they put up a daily return of visitors. The recent average was about 800 a day on weekdays, with a sudden leap into thousands on Sundays. This is not, I was told, because Birmingham has a passion for art on Sunday afternoon, but because then all the young people promenade up and down the galleries, not looking at the pictures, but at one another. Apollo has to serve Venus. But what of it? The boys and girls have to begin mating somewhere, and they would own and they could obviously begin their acquaintance in much worse places. And you never know, Venus may be a strict task mistress, but no doubt Apollo is allowed a word now and then. A picture will catch the a picture will occasionally catch the eye and then hold it, and so the old leaven of art will start working. There may be new masterpieces presented in this gallery in 20 years' time because a boy and girl were promenading, promenading and clicking there last Sunday afternoon. A director, a wise man, is of the same opinion. No doubt there are protests in Birmingham, as, as there are elsewhere, and probably from those people who must hate the whole commencement of sexes, who protest with equal vem vehemence Ve venomous against the youngsters going anywhere else on a Sunday. When they have finally driven them onto the streets, protests will be against them being there too. They forget, these protesters, that both cities and the Sabbath were made for man. If the social arrangements do not fit in with the time of old desires of ordinary decent human nature, then the social arrangement, it should be the social arrangements that change. I had a lunch in one of those buffets that are so popular now in larger provincial towns there is a chef in the wall <clears throat> there is a chef in a tall white cap whom everybody calls joe and fred and a white jacketed waiter or two and you sit on tall stools and you have a slice or two of cold meat a little salad and perhaps some cheese all very pleasant and useful in preventing one from eating a larger lunch than one needs but I take this opportunity of declaring that these places seem to me to charge a great deal more for their food than it's worth. Having, after having a, a very light lunch, you find you've paid as much as if you'd sat down and you'd demolished three or four solid courses. Why? I'm just going to have a glass of water at this point. So long as you keep within a very narrow limit in the centre, Colmore Row, New Street, Corporation Street, Birmingham has quite a metropolitan air. And on, one, and on the fine afternoon I first explored them, these streets had a metropolitan crowd in them too, looking at the windows of the big shops and hurrying in and out of cafes and picture theatres. The city has a passion for arcades, and I never remember seeing more. It also has a passion for bridging streets, usually by jo joining two tall buildings somewhere on the third or fourth floor. When you get to the end of New Street, you can cross into Paradise Street and then arrive at Easy Row. There you will find the White Hall of Memory, built to commemorate the 14,000 Birmingham men who were killed in the Great War some of them possibly with bits of Birmingham metal. Behind, his, behind, this tall, behind this hall of memory is Baskerville Place, af called after the great printer John Baskerville, and I should like to think that there was something symbolic and fateful in the conjunction of this war memorial and the famous printing press. Among the many statues in this part of the city, there is one to Joseph Priestley, whose house was sacked and burnt down by the mob not long before he himself 
was compelled to leave the country altogether. It's a pity that some of the charred remains of his library and laboratory were not kept to be exhibited by the side of the statue. Tired of walking around, I climbed to the top of a tram. I didn't know where it was going, and when the conductor came for his fare, I said, I'll go as far as the tram went, and took a threepenny ticket. As if it knew exactly what was about to happen, the sun immediately went out. This treachery did not leave us in a kindly dusk. It was too early for that, but only in the middle of a quite different day, luring and sullen. Then followed one of the most depressing little journeys I ever remember making. No doubt I was tired. And then again, the electric tram offers the least exhilarating mode of progress possible. It's all very well for the Irish poet A.E. to call them those high-built glittering galleons of the streets. But no man inside a tram, no matter how he strains his fancy, really feels that he is inside a glittering galleon. The people show a sound dis the people show a sound instinct when they desert the tramway for any other kind of newer conveyance. There is something depressing about the way in which a tram lumbers and groans and grinds along like a sick elephant. Undoubtedly, the tram helped, but it was Birmingham itself that did most of the mischief. In two minutes, its civic di dignity, its metropolitan airs, had vanished, and all it offered me, mile after mile, was a parade of mean dinginess. I do not say that this was the worst tram ride than one would have in Manchester or Liverpool, Glasgow or any of our larger cities, or smaller ones, either come to that. I'm not making comparisons between cities now. I only know that during that half an hour or so that I sat staring through the top window of that tram, I saw nothing, not one single tiny thing that could possibly raise a man's spirits. Possibly what I was seeing was not Birmingham, but our urban and industrial civilization. The fact remains that it was beastly. It was so many miles of ugliness, squalor, and the wrong kind of vulgarity, the decayed anemic kind. I was not, you understand, it was not, you understand, a slum. This, that would have not been so bad, Nobody likes slums, and the slum hits you in the eyes, and you only have to make an effort to get it pulled down. This was, I suppose, the common stuff, out of which most of our big industrial towns are made. And those of us who have not... And those of us who have not to live or go shopping or amuse themselves in such a thoroughfare as this probably do not notice it at ordinary times. We are on our way somewhere else. We let it slip past us outside the motor or the tram car without ever having a good look at it. But there I was, on that tram, to have a look at it. And if I was tired and perhaps a little low-spirited when I began... I was still more tired and more lower-spirited than before I had done. There was nothing, I repeat, nothing to light up a man's mind for one single instant. I loathed the whole long array of shops with their nasty bits of meat, their cough mixtures, their racing specials, their sticky cheap furniture, their shoddy clothes, their fly-blown pastry, their coupons and sales and lies and dreariness and ugliness. I asked myself if this really represented the level reached by all those people down there on the pavements. I am too near them myself, not being one of the sensitive plants of contemporary authorship, to believe that it does, not rep that it does represent their level. They've passed it. They have gone on and it is not catching up. Why were the newest and largest buildings along this route either picture theatres or pubs? Because most of them offer us escape. They're bolt holes, safety valves. Probably not one person out of a thousand along that road would roundly declare that all this is a nasty mess and I'm sick of it. But it is my belief that at least 600 of them out on those, out of that thousand, entertain unspoken conviction 
that this is constantly troubling them inside and that calls for either the confectionery drama of the films or for a few quick drinks. I think I caught a glimpse of what I mean. Sorry. I think I caught a glimpse then of what may seem to future historians one of the dreadful ironies of this time of ours when there never were more men doing nothing and there never was a time when so much had to be done. The conductor announced the terminus. I had arrived. I got out to find that we had climbed to the top of a hill and that a cold wind was blowing over it, bringing dust and grit and filthy bits of papers. On one side was the stretch of high brick wall with some posters which told me it was a sports ground. On the other side were some patches of waste ground and some decayed allotments where the last green rags of gardening were shivering. Further along was a yard filled with rusted parts of motor and scrap iron. I walked to the end of the brick wall and saw below me and afar the vast smoky hollow of the city with innumerable tall chimneys thrusting out of the muck. The winds dropped and all along the edge of the pavement filthy bits of paper settled for a moment before beginning to rustle ease uneasily again. A tram came making its ponderous moan and I signalled it like a man on a raft seeing a sail. On the way down I looked at nothing but some little things caught my eye. One of them was a notice outside a grimy t tobacconal. Get the Brotherhood spirit, it said. What would happen, I wondered, if we did? Surely the result would startle the, those mild folk who put up that notice, for there would first be such a burning down and blowing up and a wholesale destruction. Or so, in that depressed hour, it seemed to me. <laughs> Having got some work to do, I stayed in my room and tried to collect my thoughts and some words for them. It was difficult because of the shattering noise. Are we breeding a race of beings who find it impossible to think or rest or sleep in rooms vibrating with the roar of changing gears and accelerated engines, rooms that do not merely admit noise but shake and ache with the dreadful sounds? I stayed in this hotel bedroom for several days, paying handsomely for the privilege and the quantity and quality of the rest and sleep I obtained in it were pitiful. Only the small hours were reasonably quiet, and by that time one was often too tired and too fretful to take proper advantage of the silence. If we are not breeding these soundproof buildings, then this idiocy cannot go on, or the nervous system will surely break down. If I were a dictator, I would insist upon a series of noiseless inventions and soundproof devices and threaten with exile any ingenious but misguided fellow who invented anything that added to the din. Perhaps I ought to have said <coughs> perhaps I ought to have said all this to the page boy I sent out for cotton wool, which still remains the best aid to quiet, better than the clever little gadgets of rubber or plaster. It was late when I went down to dinner, and much later when I wandered into Coleman Row for a breath of fresh air before bed. It was not even eleven o'clock, however, and the look of these Birmingham main streets was very queer, for they were all blazing with light, and yet almost empty. Victoria Square was like another palace a la Concorde. I have never seen such brilliant illumination in a provincial city, but the old habits had prevailed. The theatres and the picture palaces had closed. The, the crowd had gone home to bed, and central Birmingham emptiedly sparkled and shone as if it expected a new arrival of more nocturnal citizens. No doubt they are already on their way. Well, I stumbled a little bit on some of, some of that, ladies and gentlemen. I apologise for that. But I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, some of that reading. Um, what have we got? I'm just looking at the comments here. People are scared. Stay safe on your bike or just going out, says... Uh, oh, right, that's an earlier conversation. 
Uh, I know perfectly well what you're saying. Well within the boundaries, we're cool, all's fine. Gary Wayne, good morning. Richard, caught your live at last. Yes, so this is just, um, as you saw, this is just me reading um, this remarkable... I, I love it. He's having a good old moan in this. This is a man after my own heart there. Having a good old moan uh, about the mean dinginess in the 1930s. And as I was saying yesterday, really, it's it's interesting to compare the 90 years ago with uh, today. And I think we're not building things quite so dingy, but in many ways we're building things that are quite sterile, I think, now. When you walk around some of the areas there where we're throwing up these cheaply constructed mass constructions and charging a handsome price for it, but they're quite sterile and uniform with mean little gardens that nobody can sit in. Not now, you know, with a crisis like we've got now, nobody can sit in their garden because they're actually probably within the two metre limit of each other, which is an irony, an irony. Or there are communal gardens that people would be very difficult to confine themselves in to stay different from each other. Um Times are changing and times always change. And it, I just find find it a very interesting time, that time of early transport, when he talks about the glittering galleons, um, the trams going along as glittering galleons, A.E. I don't know who that was he was talking about, A.E. I worked in Birmingham for 20 years. Not much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is I think this is interesting because I visited Birmingham and not worked in it and seen it every day. So some of those t uh, street names presumably had meaning to you, uh, Audrey. You know, uh, Corporation Street or whatever it was and um, uh, something row. Excuse me, blowing my hooter. Uh, Ramibu says, imagine if he saw how things had changed and what would he make of it now? Yes. Hello from a Hungarian who lives in Dorset. Hello to you. Uh, thank you for joining uh, me this morning. You should do some audio books, Richard. You have a good voice. For it. Thank you very much. Well, if I didn't stumble, I mean, I, ha I did record somebody's book once. It was, it was a very tedious thing. Um, not so much the reading, which I do enjoy, and especially I enjoyed if I've spent time working on the text so that I can get the right inflection. You know, I, I curse myself as I'm reading when... I realised that the sentence I've said, I've said it wrong, where the, the stress is in the wrong place, or I haven't paced myself correctly. And sight reading is difficult because you don't always know what's coming up, even though what I'm tending to do now is reread the chapter I'm reading just before I do the recording. So it's a bit more familiar. But I imagine if you're doing this all the time, you get a better sense of things. And, and as you get into a book, you're getting into the the tone of the author. Um, and it's very easy to read too fast. And sometimes I think I'm reading too fast when you, you, know, you need to slow down and stuff. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a learning curve. And of course, if you're doing it professionally, and I did this one book, and I had to, you know, every time, every blunder you make, every misinterpretation, when you realise, oh, I've read that line wrong, you'd stop, go back, reread it, and then you'd end up with hours and hours of um, takes, which you would then go through and edit. That's the tedium of it. And they have to, so you would hear the book several times. And if it's not a good book, um, I like reading and I love reading out loud. And I wish I was better at sight reading. I really do. And um, but I, this is where, you know, I occasionally slate the BBC for their bias and and political bias and that sort of thing but the bbc are very good with their stories that they read particularly on radio 4 because they get pro, you know actors and well-known people who are very experienced and great communicators and they read these things which no doubt they pay them handsomely um and they can you know get it absolutely right but it's when you hear that as opposed to audible and I've heard some of the Audible books, but they they tend to read... Uh, the ones I've heard on Audible, I'd be interested in people's thoughts on this, is tend to be um, read very monotone and very fast. 
especially the American ones. I don't know if that's just an Americanism. Um, but when I've heard, so for example, let's just see if this is an audible book. And I may be wrong. There may be, of course, there's going to be exceptions. And I'm talking, um, I'm talking across the board, of course. And, you know, I spent the next day, which was fine and warm at Bourneville. There were several good reasons for doing this. To begin with, I was interested in the manufacturing of chocolate, having bought and eaten it in my time great quantities of the stuff and having several times when I was about 10 tried unsuccessfully to make it myself. Then I went to see another highly organised giant works and Cadbury's was one of the biggest in the country. And again, the Cadbury brothers were renowned as employers of benefit. So they, from my experience, they tend to read relatively fast and they don't spend much time. Whereas if it was the BBC doing it and I try to emulate uh, them, I, I, as you heard, I would say things like, I spent the next day, which was fine and warm, at Bourneville. There were several good reasons for doing this. To begin with, I was interested in the manufacture of chocolate, which having... Sorry, I was going to say, say my reading is crap, really. Having bought and eaten in my time great quantities of the stuff and having several times, when I was about ten, tried unsuccessfully to make it myself. Then I wanted to see another highly organised giant works. See, I read that wrong. Then I wanted to see another highly organised giant works, and Cadbury's was one of the biggest in the country. Again, Cadbury brothers were renowned as employers of the benef benevolent and patent patient paternal. Ah, I've done too much reading. <laughs> done too much reading. But you see what I mean. Uh, but I don't think um, if you're reading books as a living and you're doing it for places like Audible, you probably you know the time it takes. Um, Audrey says even Stephen Fry has retakes. Yes, I, no, I, I imagine everybody has them. I do imagine. Um, all still there. Is that all still there? Philip Hammond, excellent, Richard. Thank you very much. See you tonight. We'll watch you cleaning up your backyard this afternoon. <laughs> Yeah, what well, you know, the content that's coming out at the moment sometimes is a little sort of um, scratching at the bottom of the barrel type thing. I bet they have 90 years. I bet they have in 90 years, though, Audrey, um, something. Uh, even start, yeah, the same streets are all still there and Brum is grim. Yeah, I, I, I used to love Bernard Cribbin. Uh, yes, Bernard Cribbin. I mean, there are some people, you know. There are just some people that I crave to be even close to. They just have character voices that are just wonderful. They're just wonderful. And, um, you know, that's it. Paul Kozoff. Koz I don't know him. Maybe I've heard him, but I don't know him by name. Uh, yeah, I don't care for reading like that, says Ramibu. Leslie Couch, yes, I've listened to Audible Readings. They just sound like that. Oh, it's good. It's not just my impression. Then. Um, and uh, no disrespect to Lisa or any American, but sometimes, it, I mean, if you're British, sometimes readings by Americans seem to have a a, a, a twang, a sort of, not. I was going to say nasally twang, but it's not nasally twang. twang. A, 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 it just, they're intonations the the magic of language and the 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 pace and the tom timbre tombra of the language i there are few americans i find really really enjoyable to listen to whereas i think british and i can only speak for in terms of english speaking you know that everybody's got their own accents and some people will favor others over others and of course it does depend on the on the context of the material um it would be ridiculous and ludicrous for an english actor to read american uh, the great american story as it were of course um and it, and it, and like in britain in america you have your regional accents and some accents i think are more appealing than others uh, and some are more lyrical and that's really nice. My accent is is fairly fairly boring, I think, because it's fairly it's it is relatively neutral. It isn't completely neutral. There will be um, influences in it, but 
you go around the country and you go down there down and I I I often wish I came from somewhere like that down in the West Country because I'd love to have a, a a natural accent so you could read in the in the autumn of 1933 J B Priestley travelled through England from Southampton to the Black Country from Tyne Tees to the flat acres of East Anglia and in search of our common well of English. This book is a triumphant result of that kind. I'd love to read, but I, that's not my natural voice, of course. And if I read the same thing, it it doesn't have the same lyrical texture. In the autumn of 19... It's, it's just very... It's almost like reading the news when I read things. In the autumn... And here is the news. In the autumn of 1933, J.B. Priestley... I suppose I could tra read it in a sort of ni stilted 1940s accent. I suppose one could do that, couldn't we? Just for a bit of a laugh. I spent the next day, which was fine and warm, at Bourneville. There were several good reasons for doing this. To begin with, I was interested in the manufacture of chocolate, having bought and eaten in my time great quantities of the stuff, and having several times, when I was about ten, tried unsuccessfully to make it myself. Then I wanted to see a highly organised giant works, and Cadbury's was one of the biggest in the country. Again, Cadbury brothers were renowned as employers of benevolent and paternal kind, and I wanted to see what it is they did. And then again, there was Bourneville itself, the village. So I went, so out I went, through, dig, so out I went, through dignified Birmingham, messy Birmingham, to planned Birmingham, which to put it on its autumnal colouring, which had put on its autumnal colouring, and was looking quite charming. So I could do it. I could do it a bit like that, and it's probably more written. I don't know how. I've no idea how J. B. Priestley spoke. I th think there are recordings. Uh, I think he made appearances on the BBC. I'd have to sort of look at those and see, because obviously, I think if you know how somebody speaks, you could probably, you know, how they write. It's an interesting method of writing that he has because I've slipped in a few modern day um, it isn't or I wasn't interested in such and such where he doesn't write I wasn't. He always writes I was not interested in this and I would have done this as opposed to I wouldn't have done this. So it's interesting and, and, uh, and I find myself slipping into those because it just seems more natural to me and, and and of course I wouldn't do that if I was researching the book and doing it um, as a professional reading it would you, you just couldn't get away with it this of course is uh, um, very relaxed <laughs> we're just surviving uh, so and and that sort of thing right said Fred says uh, Reverend Flat Flatus Andy Stacy, thanks Richard good luck with the shed thank you very much uh, Ramibu, finished and move on to the next kid. Uh, okay. Um, oh, sorry, I missed that. Don't really listen to the books. I don't know how we Americans do it, but if that's how, then that's horrible. It's like a bored kid just trying to read his lessons as fast as he can. Yes, that's true. Uh, Under Milt Wood was divine. Yes, Richard Burton. Richard Burton was... You, you know, he did Under Milk Wood, didn't he? And he also did H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. Um, and again, I think the Welsh, you know, the Welsh are very, very lyrical in their language. No one would have believed in the early years of the 19th century. Just, just remarkable stuff. And and those are the things that I do listen to and I listen to very carefully because how they read like that is... Our world was being watched as if scrutinised under a microscope. Not that that's got any Welsh in it whatsoever. Uh, Crail, now how do you pronounce yourself? Crail for Joel. I'm making a terrible stab at your name, sir. Uh, all this nice weather and we're stuck indoors. I bet as soon as this virus is, if real, I don't know anyone who's got it, passes, uh, we're allowed back out, then we'll. Pro it'll probably rain again. Yes, of course, that's... Uh, I don't know what your nationality is based on your name there, but that's very much a British outlook, isn't it? It's sod's law that we will be, the minute we're released from our imprisonment, self-imposed imprisonment, if you notice, 
uh, that it will, of course, the clouds will thicken and darken and uh, raindrops will fall. Uh, I have a thick Somerset accent. Oh, do you indeed? I oh, love that. How, how nice is that then? I used to do a character called Farmer Piles. Hello there, Farmer Piles here. We used to entertain the children with Farmer Piles. Here, and there's my little horse there. Look, there's Daisy. Daisy might... Actually, if you put Richard Vobes and Farmer Piles into... Uh, into I'm having too much fun now. Uh, into YouTube. Let me just see if it's still there. Um, let's just put... If I put Richard Vobes... Farmer Piles into YouTube. <laughs> oh my giddy aunt. Farmer Piles is actually there on YouTube. Let me just show you a picture of Farmer Piles. Do, 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 do. Now, when did I do this? This was made something like 2000 and. Oh, about 2000, something like that. Oops. What am I, I'm pressing a button here and nothing's happening. Let's try that. Here we go. There's a bit of farmer piles. Let me just turn the volume down. That's me. Oh, you beggar. Morning. So you want to know all about farming, do you? Farming, eh? Okay. Hey, you can uh, amuse yourselves <laughs> if you're really that bored. Uh, that was before I lost my eye. Bit of fake crepe hair, flat cap. I've still got that. Uh, one day I'll come down in that jacket. I've still got that jacket upstairs in my uh, collection of silly clothes. Farmer Piles. Hello there. It's Farmer Piles here. Oh, dear, oh, dear. It's all good fun. Um... Frederick Coley says J.B. Priestley. Oh, had a West Yorkshire accent, did he? Yeah, I guess you're quite. Yeah, I sh I don't know quite now. West Yorkshire, J. Thank you for that. Priestley, uh, radio broadcast. Yeah, but I want to hit uh, J.B. Priestley. Let's see if we've got uh, J.B. Priestley talking. Personalities, J.B. Priestley. Here we go. We live in... That's not J.B. Priestley. Times. Skip the advert. If you were a famous author like J.B. Priestley, you would need a library as big as his for your work. You could perhaps manage with a few less pipes. But likes That's not J.B. Priestley. Uh, here's, here's one. Try this. London's only real permanent orchestra. That is the only single team of pick players who have been trained to work together and are pledged to work together. It's also the only symphonic orchestra that I know that is entirely self-governing. Self-governing. I'll have to. Uh, I'll have to listen to some of that. See if that how uh, will influence how I read uh, the thing. Anyway, uh, I better go. I'm wasting your time. Uh, thank you so much. I've lost the. Uh, I've lost the. <laughs> I've lost the live stream thing on my audience. Um, just quickly, Mr. Biggs, really enjoy these daily readings. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. The lovely Julia, nearly complete, nearly completed. Missed it again. Um, don't worry, you can you can catch it on the rebound. Um, Rami, but have a lovely. Ah, oh, the lovely Julia, wondering where you were. How's Joseph doing? And is he over his cold? Uh, curious if you're struggling for time in the murmurings, Richard, since clocks change. Why not move this show back an hour? Yeah, maybe I ought to start it at 10 o'clock. And uh, it's just trying to get everything done. I've never been more busy than during this blooming lockdown. Now that I... Do you know, I do five bits of content every day now. I do... Um, I do... 
let me get this in the, in the order that I do them. I go out for I I upload my uh, daily video. So you've got the daily video that I do, which is pre you know pre made and what have you, uh, in the morning. I go out for a walk and I film something which I edit in the afternoon. I record the Naked Englishman podcast, which is for my patrons, which is me just burbling about what's going on in behind the scenes in my life. Um, and then there's a second video, which is the one I did, I filmed in the morning, which I've now edited and that goes out. And then the Vogue show goes out in the evening. Oh, and of course I do this live thing as well. Is that? Yeah, that's five bits of content. The reading. So, um, yeah, I've never been more busy. Uh, and it's the only way, really, I'm coping with being locked up. Uh, I'm going to binge watch some Farmer Piles. There you go. You can criticise me on the accent and tell me where it's absolutely wrong. And uh, it, or, or if there's bits of it, you know, which words I have got got right. That would be fascinating. Um, so there we are. Thank you so much for joining me. It's uh, it's just this is just great fun. I, I love I love doing this. I'm a bit of an exhibitionist. So uh, but I, I do try to do things as as well as I can. And um, I wish I could read better. Um, so there we are. Anyway, take care. Have a good day, whatever you're up to. Um, look after yourself. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Keep the right distance. All that sort of nonsense. And um it's not nonsense, I know. Um, and I'll no doubt see you, hopefully. And I'll be doing my Vogue show live at eight o'clock this evening, British summertime. And uh, that's on the Vogue show channel. So search for the Vogue show channel. Um, and hopefully tomorrow, hopefully tomorrow, there will be an addition in the studio for people to see. But I'm not going to say any more than that. A parcel has arrived and uh, Mr. Kellison will be thrilled. But I'm not saying any more than that. So there we go. Thank you so much. Until next time. Bye bye for now. Bye bye.